Hello, a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shanti. Coming up on this week's program, the US vows relentless pressure on Iran as draconian sanctions resume. But it's the ordinary Iranian that's paying the price. Officials in Iraq launch an investigation to determine what's killing thousands of fish in the Euphrates River. Also coming up, music with a message. Syrian-American rapper Mona Haidar joins us from New York. All those stories coming up, but first to a new round of sanctions unleashed on Iran by the United States, which were previously lifted under the nuclear deal. This despite Tehran's full compliance with that historic accord in 2015. Now, the latest punitive measures target core parts of the economy, including oil and banking sectors. They also deprive Iranians of access to basic humanitarian goods. Those living inside the country are already feeling the pinch. Here's Yana Lee. Maximum pressure on Iran. U.S. President Donald Trump's administration wants to hit the Iranian economy where it hurts. A new wave of sanctions targets the oil, banking and shipping industries. But also in the firing line are ordinary Iranians. I don't need the news to tell me that sanctions have started. I can feel it in my bones. I've come to shop at the market. And you can tell by the price of goods that are different compared to before. Right now we're in a whirlpool and we're going round and round in circles. I just hope we won't drown. For some, Trump isn't solely to blame for Iran's isolation, pointing their finger at Iranian authorities too. These sanctions don't have any effect on us. Every disaster we have comes from members of our government. A thousand Trumps couldn't do anything to us. Local businesses and Iranians are behind the rising price of the dollar, not Trump. The value of the rial has dropped more than 70 percent against the dollar this year, with soaring inflation mounting pressure on households. Meanwhile, renewed sanctions have scared off foreign investors, with a wave of companies suspending business operations across Iran. Some foreign executives say they no longer understand what the U.S. wants. This time, we feel that we've done everything right. We've, we've, we've involved ourselves in the international community. We've done the steps that have been asked of us, and we've said the right things. And now, what it feels like is that we're facing a bullying tactic. Washington hopes to cripple Iran's economy and force the government to change its regional policies. A defiant President Hassan Rouhani called the sanctions illegal and unjust, saying his country will continue oil sales. Over to Iraq, where thousands of dead carp were found floating in the Euphrates River, which is in the Babel province south of the capital. Authorities have launched an investigation while warning the public against buying fish. Here's Kathy Clifford with that report. Floating at the river's surface, a scaly mass of thousands of dead carp. In Iraq's Babil province, the Euphrates has become a watery graveyard, leaving local fishermen to empty their farms and count their losses. I bred 70,000 fish and my losses amount to $450,000. Where should I get my money back? Should I sell my clothes, my children? It started by the power station and spread. We don't know what the problem is, but we're asking the government for compensation. In this town, some 80 kilometers south of Baghdad, 90 percent of the carp are dead. The losses are already ringing up at hundreds of thousands of dollars across the province, where the majority of residents live off fish farming. The Ministry of Agriculture and the local government in Babil mobilized their teams to stop this phenomenon and to control it. But frankly, so far, it was all in vain because the disease is unknown and cannot be controlled. Several tests have been carried out with no concrete results at this stage. The tests have not proven that the water is poisoned or whether it was done by someone intentionally. We deal with scientific and laboratory facts, and it hasn't been proven yet that this was done by a person. 
For now, no one has fallen ill, but authorities aren't ruling out the risk of contamination for humans. This summer, 100,000 people were hospitalized in the southern region of Basra following an unprecedented water pollution crisis. Now, she's a musician with a message. Syrian-American artist Mona Haidar raps about Islam, her decision to wear the hijab and racism in the U.S., among a host of other polarizing issues. And while some have praised her efforts, others have attacked her, calling her even a mouthpiece for the Islamic State group. Mona joins us from New York City today. Thank you so much for speaking to us here on Middle East Matters. Now, being Arab is a huge part of your identity despite the fact that you actually grew up in the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm the daughter of immigrants, very proud to be Syrian-American, very proud of my roots, um, very connected to my people. And, um, you know, like growing up, the very first, one of the first songs that, I, like, ever meant something to me was Um Kulthum's Al Al Bayasha Kulle Gamil. So like, you know, I grew up in the culture. It, it's, it's a part of my DNA, you know, it is my DNA, it's in my blood. So how would you say that the conflict in Syria has uh, impacted your life because you are, of course, in the US? Yeah, you know, I feel like I have a lot of privilege and I have to use that privilege to, to shed light on um, the, the, cli the crisis. Uh, and so, you know, like one of the ways it's affected my life is, is a very privileged way that I haven't been able to take my family, my two children who are half Syrian, um, to Syria because of the, the crisis. And, um, you know, I would love to take my husband someday and, and we've been together five plus, five plus years and, you know, it's just such a, it's such a tragedy that this crisis has been going on this long. Um, you know, I have family who's been deeply affected by the situation there on the ground and, you know, it, it just, it's a cause for great sorrow in my heart. Of course, and you do speak about that in your songs. Now, I want to talk about one song in particular, Hijabi which uh, supports the right to wear hijab. And that went viral in 2017. Let's listen to a clip of that song. Now, the hijab is a massively uh, divisive topic here in Europe. Uh, some believe it's a medieval garment. It's designed by men, imposed upon women. Interestingly, this is also something that's uh, debated inside uh, your own home. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, I, I grew up, I, I decided to wear hijab on my bike in Flint, Michigan as a young girl, 11 years old. Um, nobody told me to wear hijab. Nobody even asked me if I wanted to. I decided one day that I was ready. Um, something inside of me called me to that. And, you know, like being a woman who's married, I'm married to a man and in our relationship, you know, he, he's a beautiful white American man. And, uh, you know, there are moments, especially after tragedies where he, um, would feel safer if I didn't wear hijab. You know, that um, hijab makes me a mark for people who have hatred in their hearts, people who are bigots, people who would perform violence upon a woman's body simply because of what she chooses to wear. And um, for me, hijab is a political act saying that you know, that I won't live my life according to uh, what uh, men want me to do or want me to look like. My body is not here for the male gaze. Um, and it's a spiritual, uh, it's a spiritual practice for me as well to let me know that uh, every day I walk out of my house that I'm not just this body. I'm, I'm so much more. I'm a mind. I'm a heart. I'm an intellect. And I'm a being of so much greater value than simply my hair or my body. For me, it's a feminist act, you know. Uh, looking beyond the hijab, which you've just been talking about, you've previously taken part in various initiatives to teach people about Islam because, of course, there are many misconceptions about this religion. Tell us about uh, Ask a Muslim briefly. 
Yeah, so, you know, it was a very difficult time, actually. Um, it was right after the Paris attacks and the San Bernardino uh, shootings here in the States. And, um, you know, my husband and I were just faced with great uh, sorrow in our hearts. And uh, he, especially for the first time, being a new Muslim, felt like he had to do something. He had to say something to... Uh, uh, to, to replace some of that terror and trauma with love if we possibly could. And so he went out and, and had this idea to go out on the streets with coffee and donuts and flowers and just share in dialogue with people in conversation. And what we found that it was deeply transformative, that people were very open and receptive to having dialogue. People who maybe even had uh, slight feelings of uh, Islamophobia or racism, um, they were willing to come up and talk to us and to work through that with change genuine curiosity. Um, so in all, it was a very successful project. Now, I want to end with your EP that was released on November the 1st and the message that it carries. Yeah, you know, the, the, the EP Barbarican is out now and it's just a celebration and uh, a celebration of wholeness of all people of color saying that we are beautiful, we are valuable just the way we are. We're Barbaricans. Mona Haydar, thank you so much uh, for joining us on this week's show. We're going to leave our viewers with a clip of your song, Barbarian. Thank you for watching. We them barbarians, beautiful and scaring them. Earth shaking, rattling, be wild out loud again. We them barbarians, Jasmine and Frank.